the, the almost perfect play that we saw from him on day one. So he's going to have to recapture those heady heights. But I have been impressed with his play overall. I like his lineup. I like him establishing himself the the aggressor in just about every matchup. I like that he has the lineup to support him doing that. And uh, Gun and Flame it would be my pick to take this one. Up. You know what I like? I like these deck layouts. I think it's really good to have somebody's deck splashed on screen for everybody to see before a game. Sure. Um, this particular deck, one that we've seen many times before, maybe not the most exciting. Um, fairly standard looking Maligos Druid. You did say yesterday that they tend to just play one three drop in this. He's decided to go with zero mulchers and the Feral Rage for that. Yeah. That stabilization aspect as well as the early removal. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of disagreement as to how you build this deck these days, whether the teacher package still goes in there, um, what you play, if any, in terms of mulches and feral rages, whether you make room for Moonglade portals and, uh, say, Ancient of War by cutting the teacher package. But no surprise that Gundam Flame go to basically the most aggressive build with the with the teachers still in there, trying to curve out as aggressively as possible and occupy the board and, and push damage through. So his choice here doesn't surprise me and... Uh, also, no surprise that Yog Druid is as powerful in the, J the Japan scene as it is in, in NA or Europe, or quite honestly, because we've seen one or two meta differences for sure in the in the Japanese mm -hmm. meta, but Yog Druid still as much of a terror over here as it is everywhere. And why would he only play one Maya Keep? It seems to me like that's just something you automatically put two of in when you're building a Druid deck. Uh, it is. I mean, it, it, it was a staple originally, but uh, like one Maya Keeper has been the cut honestly and it's it's not because my keeper is a bad car but it's one of those things where like even more great options have become available to the deck with arcane giant and you just simply have to find room in your deck right you can only play yeah. 30 cards so you have to look at something as the weak link and pretty much everything else serves as core talking of decks that have got more powerful as cards have developed the seven drop the curator yeah. Um, that is the card that has enabled Dragon Warrior to sustain being one of the best decks, despite the fact other decks have improved with um, Karazhan, right? Yeah, it really is. It's one of the big no-brainer decisions, I guess, in terms of Karazhan deck building, which is you're playing a deck that has a Murloc and a million dragons in it anyway. So find yourself a beast. Well, Warrior has access to one of the best beasts in the game, a three-mana, three-four taunt that it can play on turn three. So making that connection did not take exactly rocket science people yeah. started playing the curator in this deck very very early on show was the the first person to make a real impact with it getting rank one legend but no surprise that dragon warrior is still kept on trucking as a, as a hugely powerful deck yeah i mean the the monkey was something like the 32nd 33rd best pick in the deck anyway people occasionally ran one just because mm -hmm. so it wasn't a great logical leap to put it in there there was talk of people trying out coda i haven't seen anybody actually try it yet because you know a three four on turn three with taunt seems to be good enough i i mean i, I play stranglethorn tiger before i played Kodo because you <laughs> you already have bookworm right like why do you want why do you want untargeted bookworm in your deck that sure doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me just laughing because your standard response to any question about decks is put Stranglethorn Tiger in it. Correct. Um, yeah, in a format where right stats decision. matter, a 5-5-5 five, five, five that can't be unstatified until the next turn seems pretty good, I must admit. Yeah. If in doubt, put a Stranglethorn Tiger in your deck. That is my deck building advice for today. Unstatified is a word, right? Uh, it is now. Good. I'm happy with that answer. Yeah, but Dragon Warrior has, has kind of changed in complexion a bit, and it, it does require a bit of adjustment in the way you play it because it's more prepared to go long in games these days than mm -hmm. it ever used to be because of that extra gas that it gets from Curator. And um, you made the point earlier that you know Cur Curator picks you up thinly during a period of the game where you want to start using your hero power. You know, Dragon Warrior is trying to curve out, so a Finley on turn one quite often doesn't see the hero power get used until turn seven or eight anyway if they get a good curve. Um, so Curator picking up Finley then allows you to hit Life Tap more consistently because you're drawing Finley more consistently. So then you draw even more cards. So due to the amount of card draw you generate and due to just the amount of just big stuff you play in your deck, it allows you to play the deck in a slower fashion in a lot of matchups now. Yeah, I mean, a deck that you can play... And originally, when it very first came out, because it had been developed on the back of Tempo Warrior... People did play Dragon Warrior a little bit slower. Then really people realise, hang on, I'm just going to hit you in the face really yeah. hard. And But it does have that potential to play slow previously as well um, because the Tempo Warrior thing. And now, like you say, 
you can, you can do it both ways, and that's a, that's always a problem with a deck. If you can go well, a strength for a deck, a problem for the opponents. If you can go fast or slow, and that's why Druid is also so strong. Uh, all the decisions it is offered allow it to to play different games, different ways, depending on what it's playing against. Indeed. So let's go over the lineups in detail here. Gundam Flame, his full five deck lineup. Remember, we are playing. I assume best of seven conquest with one ban here which has been the format of the rest of the tournament no indication that we've received that the finals has a different format but just a reminder this is essentially a community cast we are doing of, of japan prelims in english for you in the same way that you know the the europe prelims and america's prelims will have you know a polish rebroadcast on nimsh's channel and a russian rebroadcast on one of the russian channels um so we are doing this very much by the seat of our pants with uh, with very little uh, information, even though it is on the Play Hearthstone channel. So we apologize for you know any oversights that we might have, but we're going to assume for now this is best of seven conquests with one ban, which means we're going to see Dragon Warrior, Yogg Mage, Hybrid Hunter, Maligos Druid, and Aggro Shaman going up against uh, Maligos Druid, Aggro Shaman, Dragon Warrior, Midrange Hunter, and Miracle Rogue from Yatori. So... Those are the matchups, and the opening matchup that we're going to see is going to be Yatori on his Rogue, his trusted deck, his favorite deck, versus Gundam Flame on the Yogg Mage. And these are the two decks that these players have both been opening with consistently in this tournament. Yep, decided to stick to what's worked for them so far. I guess you get this far in a tournament, and you have to weigh up, do I care if I'm predictable versus do I want to be comfortable it's the final. People are nervous. They want to be comfortable. Yeah, cannot blame them. And just a reminder, we are all the way through the grand finals now. So this is the Japan Championship. The winner of this game, this best of seven, goes through to take a spot at APAC Championships, which will be played out, the winner of which gets that coveted seat at BlizzCon. Yeah, and this mage deck... Mulliganing away two drops because it's so aggressive, it's just going to draw more of them. And yeah, why not? Get that one drop, why not, indeed. Um, no spells in hand for this Mana Worm, but that will change pretty soon, you should think. Yeah, and this matchup, Tempo Mage versus Rogue, this is all about getting an early minion to stick. If you can get an early minion to stick and start pushing through damage, most Miracle Rogues now, this one from Yatori included have cut all forms of healing from their deck. So 30 health is 30 health. You just have to be able to count to 30 to win the game. And being able to do that is a huge getting is is honestly dependent on a huge amount of leverage from your early minions because if you don't push through that early damage, you're very unlikely to be able to win the race just with spells from hand. And the production team taunting Utori there by waving a questing adventurer on the board and that is exactly the card that he'll be using to try and set up um, a huge win with here. As this mage deck has no real way to get through it, a concealed questing adventure that then gets bigger the next turn is a massive threat here. That isn't going to use the missiles here. That's an interesting decision in and of itself straight away. And I personally, right now, would like to see Yatori take the board on this turn. It's a huge investment. But I think you have to deny these minions connecting with your face. I mean, Coin SI on the 3-2 looks fine, but you yeah. can also throw in the prep of this and just completely sweep the board and get a full tempo swing. So the upside of that is this mage deck doesn't have much in the way of minions. If, if you can get rid of them, it has no gas late, and it would deny it that repeated damage. On the downside, if you do draw your auctioneer and the game goes longer, you've wasted two or three cards, but... Interesting that he chooses to keep the SI back. In yeah, I mean, he can, of... he, can, he can pair it. He still has the coin available to him, so he always has the activator for that uh, SI in his hand. But now, having drawn the Flame Waker from Gundam Flame, he might uh, be rewarded for holding on to that Arcane Missiles for a turn. This is, again, interesting to me because the pattern yesterday was Gundam Flame wanting to play more aggressive than I was suggesting, whereas um, today the pattern has been... Um, Gundam Flame playing a lot less aggressive than I think I would in the same situation. <laughs> so, so he just thinks you're wrong all the time. Yeah, That's I mean, what you're saying. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad assumption, just assuming that the caster <laughs> is wrong at all times. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fault it. Um, yeah. It's just an interesting dynamic that we, we, we yeah. seem to disagree a lot. But yeah, he does have this um, thinking outside the box attitude that I like. Uh, the previous champion, Jacko, was also the guy that D2 and I thought was the best player. But he was a very 
traditional solid player. Like he was good with his freeze mage and stuff like that and was very uh, straightforward is putting him down. But you, you get the point. He's sort of like uh, sort of like Crane. Just play the decks as they come and play them really, really well. Sure. Whereas Gundam Flame is thinking outside the box turn after turn. It's a very different style to the previous champion. So this is, um, it's both players have, have been a bit passive, really. And the, the fact that the, the passive play has been matched by the other player means that neither one has really got punished for it. Um, if both players were playing a bit more aggressive here, then that kind of would have counteracted each other as well, right? Like mm -hmm. if, Gun if Gun and Flame had pushed harder all in, then Yutori would have been able to respond with the kind of prep plays that I was advocating to be able to take the board back. So the fact that they have both held a little bit back has created the same sort of stalemate that them both pushing all in as hard as they could would have created. So it's an interesting dynamic just developing in this game so far. It's math time for Gundam Flame. Work out where his pings want to go, what wants to go where and why. It, there's, I mean, you cast both arcane missiles and then you send the, <laughs> the, the, the mana worm downtown to face. That's that's what you do every single turn. <laughs> oh my! I mean, not yes. now. Yeah, that is exactly what you do. <laughs> now he's got to make a decision because now he can legitimately keep that back for more removal. Obviously, that, no, that is a six damage arcane missiles. You cast that thing all day long. Sure. Yeah. Six damage for one. Not exactly Dennis missiles here. And 15 health already from this aggressive mage deck. From just two minions that have ever survived. And that Flame Waker is going to stick. Preparation even does not allow him to remove it. Gun and Flame looking for a spell. That will do nicely. But the Drake Arcane Blast is just looking too promising to take care of the Azure Drake here. That is as that arcane blast actually does three damage to face as well, which is right up Gundam's for Gundam Flames Alley, and this is going to have to be a miracle turn for the Miracle Road. Yeah, and something you said on turn two is you wanted that preparation to be used. Yeah, it's not going to be used all game unless the miracle does happen. But yeah, just manage not to get through and use it particularly aggressively at all. And you, know, you, you highlighted that very early on, that this this may be a card that just doesn't have any use in this game uh, later on. Yeah, I wanted the board to be grabbed on turn three using the Preparation and the SI7 Agent. He died with both of those cards still in his hand. So you have to take a look and say, was he playing too greedy that game? Did he not appreciate how quickly the game could slip away from him? Because even... Like, Gundam Flame held back that game. He could have played more aggressively, and still he died on turn six. Yeah, and Gundam Flame understanding the matchup. And in fairness, the, the very aggressive mage build is something that hasn't been around that much. So it, it's understandable why Yotori may not have bumped into that build too many times. They are playing five decks. Yotori is an amateur player. Well, not an amateur, but he's a strong player of amateur status. Like, he doesn't do this professionally, meaning. So, you know, going five decks deep, sometimes you don't get the chance to play every matchup against every other matchup unless you're a committed full-time pro. Yeah, I mean, but on the other side of that, Yotori is is one of those rogue guys, right? He said yeah. that rogue, he said that rogue is his favorite class. He said the rogue is is the the, the class he trusts coming into this. So, if he's going to have experience in all the matchups with any deck, you would expect it to be the rogue. And I, I really think he got too greedy there with his mm -hmm. preparation. I really think he should have recognized how tempo focused that matchup is, and just grab the board as early as he could. Yeah, missing an opportunity there and letting that mage deck through. So. 1-0 in what we assume is the best of seven. The, some of these finals do sometimes have funky rules, but it makes no sense, so we're going to go with best of seven until we're told otherwise. It looks like game two is ready to go. Yatori sticking with the rogue here, and he is like he's, he's facing this rogue up against some very, very aggressive decks here, so if he's going to be able to fight back against the aggression of these decks, he's going to have to be able to make those early plays where it's it's low value high tempo plays right it's throwing mm -hmm. your your preparation away for very little value just to grab the board early put the aggro deck on the back foot that's the kind of thing you really need to be looking out for in the in these kind of matchups and Gundam Flame has a lineup about as aggressive as they come these days so that's the kind of thing that he's going to need to consistently be looking out for and the thing that honestly I think he missed in the first game 
yeah, I think you're right. And you can get that value back later when you're not dying because you end up losing value just by trying to not die anyway. Uh, you have to start using your cards inefficiently to stay alive. So you might as well use them inefficiently on your own terms. Right. And there, there is no lower value than dying with cards in your hand. Then right. Those cards are literally have the value of zero. So, yeah. Okay. Gundam Flame has the opportunity. Now, we know Yuturi in the first round yesterday did not dagger up and hit a fairy dragon. And I wondered if that would have tempted Gundam Flame to coin it out and take a chance. I was about to make that exact same point, Neil. And yeah, I, I would love to see it, honestly. I think if, if you have the soul read on your opponent to say, we saw this situation before and he chose not to take nine from it with my dagger, I would have loved that fairy dragon. Even though I had no follow-up play, I would have just loved it on the board because it's an entire extra turn of damage for it. So let's see if anyone said anything to Yuturi overnight. He can challenge it with a question, which changes the equation somewhat anyway. But right. let's see what he chooses to do here. We have seen him just plop the question on the table and say, you have to trade into this more than once, I think. So yeah. that play will actually get punished, though, by the blood to Ica into coin ravaging ghoul here, especially <laughs> if, again. He doesn't choose to face tank the fairy dragon, and that's exactly what's going to happen. We're seeing him consistently get punished for this decision of just not taking nine from a fairy dragon. Now, the frothing berserker does change the equation, though. Now we might actually see the trade happen. But honestly, I would love to keep my fairy dragon alive right now. Right, and if the trade happen, if the trade doesn't happen. Uh, so if the trade does happen, it's on Gundam Flame's terms. He's let this happen on his terms. Yeah. He has the option to do this and the option not to. And the only reason not to do it is if it's better the other way. So that's even worse for Yaturi. And honestly, if you're one of Yaturi's friends and you haven't told him this overnight, shame on you. So, yeah, Gundam Flame legitimately eyeing up two incredibly good options here. It is going to be the Blood to Ica, and it's going to be the Coin Ravaging Ghoul play. And so there's the two, two, one, the two one health minions on the board, he is a little bit exposed to Fan of Knives here. In combination with the backstab that we already see, he's hugely exposed to Fan of Knives. But without that card specifically, not quite as dangerous. But this is a big deal as well, potentially for Yatori. Right, let's but see he... what he gets from the bar. There are only two or three cards in his deck that he doesn't like, and two of them are in his hand. He's lifting the preparation. He's got Leroy, which is actually a really great answer right now to taking out the, the Fairy Dragon. And now he has the dagger equipped to be able to uh, take out one of the other minions as well. So that's yeah, actually I'm... not a particularly bad outcome for him at all. What is a bad outcome is this. I was stalled there, but it's going again now. So, yeah, seems to be getting in control, in fairness to Yaturi here. Yep. Has a handful of stuff that is now going to start becoming really strong over the next couple of turns and Gundam Flame actually in you know for all the criticism of the start of this Gundam Flame's actually in a pretty bad spot right now he is but he also has a pretty miserable opening hand honestly and you know Yatori is in a good position but he's in a good position because he needed a good outcome from Barnes and he got it sure. whereas the decision to just take nine from the fairy dragon and pass would have left him with you know, something like Frothing Berserker hits the board and then he plays Questing Adventurer Prep Eviscerate it or Prep Eviscerate Van Cleef, right? It, yeah. it's, it just would have changed the complexion of the game completely. So now we're probably going to see, well, I guess we see Prep Evis Van Cleef now, but the other options are fair as well. Um, yeah, I mean, he could just choose to go with the Drake here, but combining that preparation and that Van Cleef together look pretty promising. Especially, you know, turning off cast division for a second here. Yatori has just seen execute number yes. one. So he thinks the value of making an enormous minion right now is pretty high. So six six Van Cleef is looking pretty promising. And the card that's gonna be possibly instrumental now is that as a Drake next turn. Yeah. Because both players are, are running out of things, especially after this execute happens. And <laughs> The ability to put down a 4-4 and draw a card, unsurprisingly, is really good. Yeah, Azir Drake is like the ultimate card to have in your hand as a rogue when you make these kind of all-in plays. If the remaining card that you have is Azir Drake, you feel so much more comfortable about you know going all-in on a questing adventurer, going all-in on an, on, a, on an Edwin Van Cleef, because worst comes to worst and they can deal with it, you still have the best 
single card refill in your deck. You know, Gadgetan is awesome, but you need all the cards to pair with it. Like Drake is just a solid card that you can drop on the board, start refilling your hand, start rebuilding your game plan and making another push. Uh, Gundam Flame might not be in a bad spot if he can draw a dragon next turn. Um, this hand still from your Tory, not going anywhere fast, but it could be going somewhere fast if that cold blood starts to do some work. Yeah, he's lifting it up. He's hopeful. He doesn't get it though. Does get a Corcoran Elite, which is Second at least prize. an answer. Yeah. Is at least an answer to the Azure Drake. And we made this point before. You know, Gundam Flame has shown himself to be an incredibly aggressive player. But I asked you the question earlier, Lorinda, how many times have you left a Drake up against Miracle Rogue and not got punished? For yeah, it? and the answer is still zero. And one one wasn't left up before. This is not going to be left up. You've got to kill this off. Rogue has too many things to do. Tempo Skulker into a War Axe? Really? Um, really now? Conceal it? No. I, mean, I assumed he wasn't, but then I suddenly thought, well, what's he going to do? And this is going to get massively punished if a dragon comes. It's going to get punished from the War Axe, but if a dragon comes here as well... And the draw is not a dragon. The, the Corrupted Oh, but this could be green. huge. Finley he, is a really big deal. If he can get Life Tap here, he'll probably just win this game. He did. Nailed the Life Tap. So the, the question now for Gundam Flame is Tempo Skulker this turn or Life Tap this turn try and pick up a 4-drop or a 3-drop? I like the Tempo... Um, corruptor, and hit hit the skull hit the skull in the face, and then play, probably Grom into whatever comes down next turn, and then just start tapping away to fill everything back up. Yeah, I like it too. But any any of the high value minions, no, this, this rogue is just, things. This is just one of those rogue draws. Any questing Gadgetan draw, you know, even a tomb pillager at this point that he can jam and conceal and threaten to deal nine to face with next turn would potentially give him a route to win this game, but. Now he is just in a world of trouble. And now he decides what to try and hit with his weapon. Having ignored Fairy Dragon for a whole tournament. Okay. And the draw is a Fairy Dragon right on time. And I think this is just going to be Tempo Grom to face. Yeah, I, I, I like the Grom here. If that, if that Dragon had been maybe a 4 or 5 drop, then consider it with a tap. But I think just Grom to face. Your opponent's shown no way to deal with a 5-4. The only way he's going to be able to deal with a 4-9 or 4-10 is just to sap it, which, to be honest, is not that bad for you right now. Yep, especially since you know there's no real minions in hand, so it's not like he can... He's not like he's, he's unlikely to be able to get a tempo sap out, right? Where it's sap and play something to develop the board. He would need to pick that up on this turn to be able to do that, so... And also, you get to keep a dragon in your hand, which, which is a deal. Right. Sure. Yep. I mean, it, it makes things like Bookworm relevant. It makes a second Corruptor more than anything the most relevant that you can. Even, uh, you know, Even Twilight, 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 Twilight Guardian yeah, gets activated. Yeah. Gundam Flame does seem to have this knack. I mean, Yaturi's hand has been terrible this game. Let's, you know, he's had that thing that rogues sometimes do. We've talked about it a lot in this tournament, in fact, where they just draw all their, their garbage. But Gundam Flame seems to really make the most of those situations where it starts off kind of bad but hangs in there i mean his the, the weird thing is his hand has been great but it's been beaten by a bad dragon warrior hand because he had the hand that you know made an early questing adventurer or made a huge early van cleef which is what he did it's just unfortunate that that ran into two executes which is not what the dragon warrior would want in their opening hand and those two executes have completely shattered the rest of the game plan because the rest of the game plan from here would be slap cold blood on that huge minion that you made, hit the face, cast that conceal that's in your hand, and then the game is over. So um, this so is it, Curator it, Dragon, right? The Curator is not a dragon. No. no, play Curator, play Fairy Dragon. Oh, I see. Right, that's, yes. That's just the turn here. Uh, yes, he was rolling his eyes as if he didn't like it. I can't work out what his problem with it is. But I don't know. it looks fine. It looks like a pretty... Don't worry, Gundam Flame. This is fine. Wow. So, number two. And this is the rogue turn. Preps. <laughs> oh, no. I thought, okay. He's just going to he's just gonna concede in the most stylish way possible. I thought it was going to be the prep, cold blood, yeah. feel, concede turn. But the no. one I've been moaning about that rogue players always complain about is they show you their bad hand of cards they put in their deck on ladder. 
But like I said, that hand of, you know, that terrible looking hand would have won the game if one of those early minions would have stuck to the board. So the double execute draw with zero dragons early from, from Gundam Flame actually ended up winning the game because he was just able to deal with every threat that the rogue played. Yep, and in come the production team to take up their places yet again, selecting decks. And credit to this tournament, to be fair. Um, other than the latency issues, they have got on with matches. There's been very little talk stone between games. I know it probably seems like an eternity to you guys, but you know we've we've turned off mics for maybe five ten minutes at the very most at times, mm -hmm. and they've just they've just got on with the tournament for the large part. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there, there's obviously been some connection issues with the venue, with the, you know, that we have seen spectator mode disconnects. We've seen some actual disconnects in the games. We've seen a lot of latency issues where, you know, turns have just kind of stalled for a few seconds. Um, but, you know, outside of that, which is clearly no no fault of the production team, they have seemed completely on top of things. And honestly, when, when there's issues that are outside of control and you still manage to get the tournament moving on nicely, then, you know, that's even more credit to the admins and the production staff. So... Yeah, they took the opportunity last night as well. When one of the games couldn't be played due to issues backstage, they thought, you know what, we'll give people an extra game. We'll just stick it on the stage. And yep. to be honest, I'm all for that in general. All right, so Yatori again has this rogue versus an aggressive deck matchup. And it's it's just not going away. I'm going to assume, based on the decks that we've seen now, that Yatori chose to ban out the aggro shaman and the Gundam's Flame remaining deck after this is the Malagos Druid. But he still has to find his way through yet another aggressive deck. And I like this. Finally, Yatori looks like he's going with the plan to play <laughs> a big questing adventurer early. Yeah, it's interesting. He's playing it like more traditional Miracle Rogue. I wonder if he hasn't picked this deck up many times. He's really used to the other version or something because he hasn't felt comfortable with his questing adventures for most of this tournament. He says Rogue is his favourite class. He has to have been playing <laughs> questing. He just has to. This has been like the version of the deck. It's the deck that we've seen players bring to tournaments. It's been, you know, the, the successful deck in the sure. meta for the longest time. Like, he just, he has to have sit. He has to have experience with it. Okay. So, I sound like convincing there, right? Yeah, you did. Good. Um, so, Gun and Flame, not much to think about here. Just curving through his Hunter deck. And so, the times that Hunter decks have a lot to think about are in these tense board states. But the rest of the time, they do kind of just curve out. For sure, yeah. Um, but the, he has curved out pretty impressively. But it remains to be seen whether this curve is going to be good enough against the hand that Yatori uh, does have here, because he does have potential for a really, really big questing um, plus an early conceal. Or, you know, an, a, a decent-sized questing plus an early conceal, which will then snowball into a huge questing. Yeah, I mean, if he does it... Well, he, he now has to think about it every single turn. Do I questing, coin, conceal? That, that's on his mind every turn from now on. Um, you can kill a grandmother in the process which is something you probably shouldn't say on a PG channel. Yeah, this seems fine to just do it now, doesn't it? Um, I mean, so if not, you you probably have to just point out... Sorry, you probably just put out your Pillager, but... Right, that's the other option, because Coin Pillager is totally valid, because you still get that coin back that you can use to rebuff the questing on another turn. And again, oh, this is so unfortunate that these issues keep coming up with the, I assume, the venue internet. It has to be. Um, but this is a really, really key turn here for Yatori. So I really hope he gets to complete the play he wants to make. And yeah, it looks like it's happening. But that is a lot of resources used that are yeah. not for his questing. There go all his naught costs. Although, he, like you say, he does get this coin back in a moment. So he will still have the conceal, the coin. And then the turn after, he'll have Blood Mage and SI7, something like that. So it should still be a 5 or 6-6. Six, six. Sure. Both high mains drawn as he's about to drop his barns. That's not what he was looking for. Infested Wolf is now pretty much the strongest outcome he can get. Both grandmothers have been played. Huge Toad is is you know above average. It, well, it's above neutral, we should say. But yeah. still, the you know both grandmothers drawn, both high mains drawn. Those are the big impacts that you're looking for. So that was never going to be the greatest of barns. And Gundam Flame probably just finds himself falling behind from here. Yeah, Yutori's just got to plot out exactly how he wants to go about it. He has the option, of course, just to just to bump in here, play the questing and conceal, but he has probably other options that involve 
making a board as well. He just likes this. Seems yeah. fine. He gets the coin next turn. Yeah, so much value in this conceal this turn because he also gets to protect the 5-1 Tomb Pillager and let that dictate another attack next turn, which means, you know, if Gundam Flame had any hopes of, you know, putting a chunky minion on the board this turn, then that 5-1 would just be instantly removing the value. So Gundam Flame is going to respond in the only way he can, which is just playing small minions instead, pushing the damage. He knows that this is a face race now, but his hand is not a face race hand. It's a play high main get sapped hand. So... <laughs> He's going to have to find some advantage from here moving forward. Yeah, you're totally playing with that sap. is scaring me. Yes, put that other one down. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's going to be pretty good, though. Uh, nothing exciting for him to put the 5-1 into, but... I mean, it does get him a coin, which gives him another immediate 1-1, one, one, and he could have... He could have traded off the 5-1 for little value there and then instead used the coin to be an additional card before yeah. to play a Van Cleef. And, and now he, he loses six his six questing. On the questing adventurer. So definitely the option to consider there. The 5-1 doesn't have that much value on the board anyway. It is just going to get traded by one of these 1-1s one eventually. So, And if he'd done it the other way, the questing now would definitely live. But this way, if Gundam Flame feels it fit, he can actually kill it off. Uh, because it would have been a 6-6 six, six with the coin. Yeah. And he'd only have 5 attack on the board if you count the weapon. But now he can just kill it. Sure, right, yeah, based on like things from hand. Things right? that we can see as casters. Right, right, right. Yeah, Sorry, sure, yeah. I'm not sure. saying it's a misplay or anything like that. I'm just saying things that we can see as casters. Had he chosen the other route, it would have worked out better for him. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but Yatori, the big decision here is that Yatori ended up saving that sap here for the high main. Um, I mean, I assume he's saving sap for the high main. He could be saving sap for the casters. That's always a valid line as well. Definitely. Um, but yeah, Gundam Flame recognizing that High Main is not going to be his win condition. Oh, and he's Damage doing that thing. Is going to be his win condition here. I mean, this this is not as advanced a read as some of his previous. Sure. Stuff. This is just you know knowing the matchup at a core level, but still strong recognition that that High Main was never going to win in the game. He needs to push the damage. Yeah, and just the the feel that, that he knows it's possible to beat this questing. Is, is the only read I was excited about there, that he yeah. just you know, worked out that he can race his questing under ideal circumstances, which is far from what he actually has right now. All right, let's 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 try and do some maths here. Eviscerate is five. He can play four cards this turn at a maximum. Uh, so that is questing at nine. The Eviscerate makes 14, 17, 18. I believe he is short. I'm hoping I'm hoping that count stands up in court. I'm I'm saying absolutely nothing as you can tell. I'm, I'm letting you be right or wrong yourself on this. I don't need your glory. That is a shadow strike. So, yep, Gundam Flame has found himself out here. Any source of damage in the deck, quick shot, kill command, unleash the hounds. They will all do it here. Huge toad, not one of those cards. He made the push. He doesn't find it, but still good recognition of the situation. But Yatori finally finds himself a win with that rogue deck, gets himself on the board. Yep, and little sporting gesture there. He committed suicide last turn, last game, and Gundam Flame just repaid the gesture and committed suicide himself this time around. Uh, 2 1, and the rogue is out of the way. And Yatori has done this pattern every single match, by the way. He's just got the rogue out of the way first, no matter how long it's taken. Yeah, and it's it's a big deal, honestly, for him to to get that rogue win because he did just keep queuing it into these aggressive decks that can really ramp up the pressure on the rogue. You know, not only are they are they classically aggressive archetypes, but Gundam Flame has built has built them as as aggressively as he possibly can. Um, so he he's been he's built his lineup honestly in a way that just by nature, I'm sure it's not targeted at rogue. These are just the way he likes to play these decks based on what we know about him. Um, but it just, uh, by nature, just ends up preying on Rogue just by the pure amount of aggression that he has in his lineup. So that Rogue being able to pick up a win in Conquest format is is pretty important for Yatori's long-term hopes. Here. And because of that, playing the, the community cast guessing game, yes. well, I think we can assume that Agro Shaman was banned out. Yeah, I, I, I made that same guess earlier. I would assume that Agro Shaman has bitten the bullet here because it's it's just the most aggressive of a very aggressive lineup. And so I think Gundam Flame's two decks left that he has to play with are the, the Hybrid Hunter and the Malagos Druid. 
And I don't think we've got any particularly good clues yet as to what Yotori got, what well, was banned, had banned, but uh, it could be pretty much anything actually with this lineup. Interesting. So Gundam Flame actually is one of the few people in this tournament that has not followed the, the predictability mm. thing that we've, we've talked about several times. I think almost everyone has been re-queuing a losing deck after they lost with it. But Gundam Flame, after losing with his Hunter, has queued with his Druid here. Yeah, and I'm just flicking through on my notes, actually, and I don't think he's ever queued the same deck twice. Oh, he has. Yeah, he queued Shaman twice yesterday, so completely unpredictable quite possibly just randomizing Which suggests that yeah he is he is rng'ing his picks right if there is just no discernible pattern to what he's doing that is the goal for a lot of people yep. in conquest just do not create a discernible pattern as to what order you're going to pick your decks in okay and that's yeah fantastic again to see so picking up the weird start that's all i'm going to call this the one where you have to decide can he kill a Fandral? But against a 2 on fire back, that decision is made very easy. Yes, he can kill a Fandral a lot of the time. Not if you Moonfire it. But not if you Moonfire it. Play your Moonfire, play your turn 1 Fandral, play your turn 2 Power of the Wild, kill his Animal Companion on turn 3 with your Feral Rage. I like where this is going. Yes, and the value is going to be absurd if it goes that way. And it's hard to see how Yotui can stop it going that way. Like, what is he going to do? Quick shot it and hope that he can finish it off next turn with the animal companion? Like, oh, play he... an abusive sergeant? Like, this is just a miserable situation. We've seen him feed his minions to the wolves many times. And this time around, I think it's correct because he has the quick shot back up next turn. So does Gundam Flame just ignore that and hit it with his face and not, not rush the... Um... The, the, I mean, the Power of the Wild still gets your guy out of range of any yeah. noteworthy trade that your opponent can make on turn three without a beast on the board. So, yeah. yeah. It's literally just Huffer. Yep, just Huffer. Anything else gets completely blown out by Feral Rage. Nope. Oops. Sorry, buddy. This game is kind of over. Yeah, any sort of non-ridiculous draws here from Gundam Flame. Um, and yeah, <laughs> just getting eight armor against Hunter on top of all the other silliness that's happening this turn. It's a big, big deal. And okay, Yutori, just make Toad quick shot four three, curl up and cry. Pretty much, yeah, but now having drawn that kill command, he does have an answer for the Fandral. So if Gundam Flame whiffs from here, there is a there is a chance yeah. that Yatori can climb his way back into the game. Yeah, and he's something like a that. Yog. Yeah, he's going to respect that, not expose his beast to the board, so he can guarantee that next turn he has beast kill command to take down the uh, the, the Fandral. And that, while growth... is not a whiff. It's 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 a semi whiff. It's a whiff for this turn, but it gets him into arcane giant positioning for both of the follow up turns. Then. Yeah, and I, with his opponent on seventeen, I'm calling that not a whiff. Sure. Um, any other situation then possibly, but eight eight back to back seems like a pretty good position to me. Yep. So I'm sure we will see arcane oh, giant number free, one. Yeah, now. we get a free we get a raven. Free raven idol in there as well. He picks up a living root. This turn is bananas. Or another raven idol. <laughs> well, but living roots takes out. Sure, you yeah, kill the toad and just make an eight-eight. But yeah. I'm not as greedy as you, Sotto. Yeah, I know. I'm comfortable with my simple pleasures of living roots into living roots into living roots into two giants. Yeah, I mean, he could just infinitely loop living roots. I mean, the greediest thing is living root is is a raven idol, raven idol, raven idol, raven idol, living. Yeah, root, yeah. And then play two giants. Why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dream world happens sometimes, but not often enough. So now suddenly the initiative is in the hands of the hunter player because that how master does allow him to start making an aggressive push of his own. But the swipe in hand can have a big <laughs> impact here. But the swipe plus giant is just one man short of being able to be a big tempo player of its own. Right. But swipe hero plower hero plower. Is power sure. a word? It is I now. So. I'm going there to go you with go. your answer from earlier. Um, but the swipe hero power allows him to at least tidy up and mean that he is uh, not under any threat of a big aggressive push from the hunter here. But he, 
as we mentioned, does not respect the board whatsoever. He's going to set up the lethal of his own. Definitely the right decision. And Yatori, no answer to this arcane giant. Yep. And that's it. 3-1. And we think it's best of seven. We're going with that. So Gundam Flame is going to have to find a win with his hunter. And although I was saying earlier that it's been a bit iffy in this tournament, it's not being catastrophic. <laughs> She's just playing with the vegetables. This is grand <laughs> finals. We got places to be. We got APAC to go to. This is the road to BlizzCon. We ain't got no time for vegetables. Do you know how to make that water run infinitely in the bottom right hand corner? I do not. No, no nor do I. I was, I was actually hoping you knew. Okay. I've seen it done multiple times over the last two years. I've never managed to get anyone to tell me. I like it's like some conspiracy. So. Anyway, importantly, after playing with the vegetables, he's still 3-1 down. He is, and that means the Gundam Flame is on the hill. Just one more deck to win with. We know what it is. We know it's the Hunter. We've seen it already played, and it did fall to the Rogue. But now he has three shots with this aggressive hybrid Hunter to find himself a win against uh, Yatori's lineup, which uh, can be exposed a little bit by these aggressive decks. Yeah, um, at least he's got his Rogue out of the way. That's the only upside for him here. Not just because it's his only win, but it is definitely a deck that would struggle mightily against this lineup in general. Um, mm -hmm. What do you queue? I mean, the Dragon Warrior is going to have a really difficult time. I, I know it doesn't matter, but the, the thing being you get to 3-3 three, three, and then you hope your opponent sort of suffers with nerves. So in yeah, terms of what, I, what do you think is the best matchup? Not what do you queue? Let's go with that question. What I think is the best matchup against the Hybrid Hunter yeah. of Yutori's remaining decks. Um, That's a different question. It's it's hard to say, honestly. I mean, I don't I don't think any of them are all that favourable. <laughs> I mean, Druid Druid relies on on getting the fast start. If they do, then you know they're mm -hmm. they're immensely favoured. Uh, Warrior, pretty much the same thing. You're living and dying by whether you get Champion or War Axe in your opening hand and. Uh, his hunter, I just think the way he's built it, it's just less consistent than than um, than Gundam Flame's hunter because <laughs> in theory, Yatori, yeah, Yatori is the guy with the one of Argent Squire, one of Abusive, one Tracking, one Direwolf, one Argent Horse Rider, one Deadly Shot, one Unleash the Hounds, etc. Like this, it's just such an inconsistently built deck that I would just in a you know in a, in a gun to my head and say which of these hunter decks is going to win. It's like well, the one that's going to curve out consistently. So. I'm, I think Gun and Flame is just in a really, really strong spot here. Okay. So, Sotl picking the guy who's 3-1 ahead in the final to be in a strong spot. In line with my predictions yesterday about the double innovate hand. <laughs> I'm going to treat that with the contempt that it deserves, Neil Bonds. And we are going to move into quite possibly the most important game of the day. One of these next three games is going to decide as a champion. Gundam Flame will be hoping it's this first one. Yatori will be hoping it's the third. But we are going to find out very soon. So is keeping a Wrath here to back up your living roots an option? Or is it just not enough ramp likely to be drawn? I think you need I think you need to push for ramp. If you spend, you know, turn one, turn two just clearing threats and the threats keep on coming, eventually you're gonna get yourself into the position where you just miss a threat check, right? They yeah. you, they they just like play a dude and you just don't have the removal for it this time. And this looks really familiar. It does. The three five has a different name, a different shape, and a different gender, but apart from that, this is the same play. Your moonfire a two one. You play your turn one, three, five, you snowball the game from there, and you win the damn game. I think he's considering... I think he's going to do it. I think he's just working out whether he wants the one damage to go to his face or the teacher. Oh, or yeah. Whether, you, or whether you, he wants to get the extra deal Yeah, you moonfire last, 100%. Yeah. Like, one out of three times, it's the same outcome. You just have a three, five teacher on the board. Um, one out of three times you have an extra 1-1 one, one on the board, and one out of three times you have the debatably better or worse situation of having one damage on your teacher. So, yep. like, yeah, you do it. You just, it doesn't Sounds really good to me. The outcomes, yeah. Okay, so Gundam Flame, having seen this from the other point of view a minute ago, uh, he will have Hounds in his deck almost certainly. I'll just check that. I think he's got two. Uh, Gundam Flame? Yeah. 
Uh, Gun and Flame does indeed have to unleash the hounds in his deck, yes. So that will be handy if this teacher starts running Riot and he can draw them. Uh, but other than that, this is a pretty good start for Yutori, obviously. He is going to need to fill the gap between turns sort of three and four a little bit with something some of the time because Gun and Flame's hand is half decent here. Uh, but Living Roots is the dream answer to this 3-2. Gun and Flame is going to need one of these token shots to go to the 3-5. And then he's going to need to roll a Huffer again. This game is looking very familiar, Lorinda. Yeah, but Gun and Flame, I predict, will roll the Huffer. I've predicted everything else for him. I might as well go all in. Let's see what he gets. Let's find out. The other big difference this game, and he gets it. Neil Bond, you absolute god. But the other big difference is that if there was a Misha in that situation, Yatori did not have the Feral Rage blowout that we yeah. saw on the other side. So even Misha there would have actually done the job for him. And also, obviously, you know, we've seen the difference as well between Fandral and Violet Teacher. Violet Teacher is an incredibly good card, but Fandral is even better than that. Yeah, it's it's just not Fandral Staghelm. Fandral is is just one one of the strongest cards to be printed in the game for quite some time. Uh, that innovate is nice though, because now um, Yutori can gain himself a mana crystal, and suddenly he's creeping towards Malagos territory. Yeah, Malagos. Unless there's a deadly shot, it's going to be incredibly hard to deal with. In fact, it won't be dealt with. It'll be ignored and hoped, um, if necessary. Lots of options here for Gundam Flame. These these weird board states that do make the hunter messy for a while. And just gonna clear up, get the board, and hope that Yutori doesn't have a play. But Yutori does have an 8-8 eight, eight play. If he wants he does. it. He does. He does indeed. He also now has a violent teacher play though, which uh, might just let be able to leverage the shape of the board a little bit better. But it looks like he is going to uh, take his no. I was about to say I think he was going to take inspiration from the A8 that just beat him up in the previous <laughs> game and get an A8 on the board. But it looks like he's favouring the teacher here, which is gives him more long term advantage going forward with the token generation to be able to fight back against multiple minions a turn. So this is the turn where Gundam. Oh, okay. I was waiting for him to draw anything other than that. I was going to say he needs to work out if he's going to win with the Call of the Wild or if he's going to you know, try and ever do anything else. But now he's got the option to just keep the board a little bit because Call of the Wild into Call of the Wild, it turns out, is kind of good. Yep. Um, but you know what else is kind of good? Yeah. A 4-12 dragon on the board. And there again, you see the option of just, you know, do you take a 2-2 two -two off the off the Maya Keeper? Well, no, you don't, because he's spent his mana on every turn up until now, and just and now he has a Malagos on the board. It's it's just a 2-2 two -two on the board is just such a tiny advantage compared to gaining mana. Yep, every single time. Uh, if he didn't have this Malagos on the board now, let's let's forget the giant as well, just to be really annoying. But if there's a 2-2 two -two there, this would be a very, very different game. So there is there is just no world where yeah. we can try and interact with this Malagos. It's 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 looking like it's going to be a defeat for Gundam Flame either way here because he just hasn't got enough of that aggressive damage through early, but he loves to base his game plan on. But is there a world where you beat this Malagos? I just don't think there is. So you have to ignore it and send the damage down to face. Yeah, I mean you're not you haven't got much damage in hand even though it looks like it because these things are pretty easy dealt with. Just a swipe clears board while this Malagos lives. Yeah. And so you just have to hope that your huffers from the Call of the Wilds can somehow get it done with their ten damage. Right, but I mean like so you can trade your fiery bat and a bow charge in this turn, and then you trade a huffer and your bow charge in next turn to kill the Malagos, right? That's that's what Gundam Flame was thinking about that yeah. turn. That's just not going to be a game-winning play. Yeah, you're looking at the Druid on such a high health total that um, this is definitely the play that gives him some outside chance of winning, to be fair. Uh, it looks all over, but you know, there's 10 points over the next two turns represented in Gundam Flame's hand. There's three from the weapon. Yutori should be able to do something, and none of these disconnects have actually yet resulted in a disconnect. Ooh, although that one did at least dump the giant back in his hand, so he has to replay it here. And or, or is this, okay, I was going to say that looks like some kind of awkward hovering card glitch, but maybe Yutori just replaying the giant is going to get his four damage 
through i hope i i wow. just don't know what's happening anymore it's like I'm independence testing. day with the everything changing on the television screens all at once right the game is now on gundam flames getting frustrated Ooh! how good is that abusive sergeant does that actually it does change the world yes it changes the world because gundam flame can push 10 here uh-huh and then next turn he can plus five plus two because the two will come from the abusive sergeant in some worlds where no taunts or deaths happen right in the actual world we live in he's dead to swipe um but from his perspective this gives him the lethal push that he's looking for so i'm sure it's the only possible play we can see this turn the call of the wild hanging as well this this game is hanging on a knife edge, not just as to whether Gundam Flame is able to seal it, but as to whether the uh, internet connection yeah. is going to stay stable long enough for it to complete. So I do believe if this one was disconnected, that Yuturi would be given the win. Because he has the lethal in his hand. Uh, if it disconnected there, then no, because Gundam Flame could have still chosen to trade into the Arcane Giant. Yep. Yeah. Um, but this swipe is going to end the game. Goodbye, board. 12 more goes through to face with the minions. And that is Yatori climbing his way back to 3-2. And thankfully, the game finished its natural course there. Um, because both players would have been upset at it being finished. I mean, now they're not. But at the time, Gundam Flame probably thought he was going to win. And yep. now he's got to pick himself up from that disappointment. He's done that fine so far. But, you know... One turn away with your lethal in your hand from BlizzCon, or from, sorry, from the APAC Championships. Right. So. He does. He has to suck it all up and just start going again. And this this Hunter, you know, you, you said that most people, Hunter has been struggling a little bit for them. Um, and when you when you made that point, you know, I countered to say that, well, you know, Gundam Flame has, has been performing very well with his Hunter. It's been a good deck for him. But now at the last hurdle, is the Hunter going to let him down? I imagine he'll get it done. I think you'll. I think Dragon Warrior is a pretty decent matchup for the Hunter, even with curators and stuff going on. But it's by no means certain. Like we've we've made this point a few times over the weekend. Hearthstone at the moment, hard counters are not a thing that exists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely the case. There's the the matchups are nowhere near as polarized as they used to be. It's it's a byproduct of people understanding the metagame a lot more of decks getting more refined so they plug their weak matchups just by and just pulling everything closer together it's also indicative of you know a meta where a bunch of just tempo decks all just try and curve out against each other a lot of the time right it's it, it yeah. brings the matchups closer together just by nature so there are no real blowouts here um for either side so just by the pure nature of you know gundam flame having two bites at the cherry to Yatori's one, essentially. He, he has to be in a favourable position. Right, let's see if he can get it done first time, or is he going to go to a best of seven? So, Gundam Flame, this is an interesting decision right off the bat here, because Gundam Flame is keeping the lose to Fiery War Axe hand. He has Argent Squires in his deck, right? So he, can, he could choose to push really, really aggressively for the start that's actually resistant. But even then, Argent Squire can get met with a blood to Ica. So I like this decision to just keep the, the double two drop in his hand and just say, this one game, this one game that matters more to me than any game of Hearthstone I've played in my life, please keep that fiery war axe out of my warrior opponent's hand. For the, for the first, first time <laughs> in the history of Hearthstone. Yeah. Stealing the lines from Sotl there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's a terrible hand for Yatori here. None of those cards are Fiery War Axe. And this is an enormously aggressive opening from Gundam Flame because of it. And look at that smile. Look at that smile on his face. He knows what the deal is now. He coins a 3-2. He shuts his eyes and he prays for the absence of a certain game-winning weapon. That's a beautiful reaction in fairness where he's just like absolutely knows what it's all about here just just terrified and also excited at the same time now surely he feels like he's gonna to go to the apac championships long way to go in fairness but we can see double animal companion and houndmaster hanging about as well yeah um the game is 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 well in favor of gundam flame already but what could completely blow it out here 
is this animal companion because honestly all of these outcomes are fantastic leoc is the dream no thinking about whether he wants to try and trade into it to protect say a misha that came out of it no consideration of whether he has to trade a huffer into it just takes the advantage from the leoc that he gets trades in the huge toad for tempo now how master is coming down this is snowballing turn on turn here for gundam flame as the hunter yeah yuturi's still sat there with three of the cards he had in his hand on turn one uh, that's how bad his opening hand was it's not like he's had the chance to play them yet and so he's been just limited entirely on this occasion by his hand and he's probably thinking why now but in fairness, it's why now? Because he lost twice with Rogue that he chose to just keep bringing and playing. And the aggression continues. No sign of a trade from Gundam Flame. Just four more oh. damage downtown. The triple eight drop draw is just not what he would have been looking for here. There's the War Axe just to taunt him on the on the first turn that it probably has no chance of being relevant in this matchup. That is just about the worst timing he could have had to pick it up. This time he rolls Leoc number two. Is this just 11 more damage going straight to the face? I think it might be. Gundam Flame braces himself in his chair there as well. Sitting back and just thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. He's just making sure to take his time. But yeah, sitting back and he looks pretty excited, Sottle. He does. Bookworm on curve though. Bookworm does have the opportunity to counter the Leoc. Which means uh, that that reduces some of the damage off straight away. He did need some help with taking care of that Leoc. Because with it protected behind the Torn, it's difficult for him to get to without face, ta face tanking more damage with the Fiery War Axe. But it's just not going to be enough to address the state of this board. He's just taking far too much of a beating. This looks like it could be the closing moments. And the guy that we've been saying deserves it for the whole tournament looks like he might be booking his spot at APAC. Yeah, looking really good for Gundam Flame. There's some token clearing in more ways than one coming on here, but uh, what will he do here? Seven damage already being represented from Gundam Flame. That is the two he needs. Unleash the hounds. It came down to a perfect curve hunter draw in the end, but this is the man, in my opinion, that has deserved this seat the most. He has played outstandingly throughout this tournament impressed me i think impressed you lorinda yeah. and i want to congratulate him as a representative and i'm personally going to be looking out for him as a potential big threat in the apac summer championships now yeah it's really nice to sit there and say before like the quarterfinals or during the quarterfinals we think this is the best player and to be able to say in all honesty after the tournament we think the best player won and i'm yeah. absolutely sure that the best player that we saw there were some players we didn't see, but the best player we saw by a mile has won this tournament. And he has to fancy his chances at APAC. Uh, he's kept really calm the whole time as well. Yeah, he really, really has. And there's there's you know one or two tiny, tiny shaky moments that we saw. Um, the the big mistake, which I, I honestly think was just a misclick in the end, more than likely, of just you know firing the picking up the living roots and just releasing it too early before he got to the target he actually wanted to cast it on. In a, in a game that he was destined to lose either way. But outside of that, you know, just his 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 greater understanding of matchups and his understanding of, of the power of being the aggressor, right? We, we've seen him ignoring Violet teachers just to go face when his opponent was still in the high 20s of life. That's how much he values being aggressive in this game. And I think that level of understanding and that level of, uh, of skill with these aggressive decks has really justified him booking his spot at APAC. Yeah, and that, again, go back to that other turn that he did, just because it's not all facings he did. There was a turn where he chose, with Violet Teacher on the board, not to go innovate uh, Power of the Wild, instead just choosing to hero power the remaining Zoom minion on the board and do the, the innovate play the turn later, uh, which turned out to be absolutely incredible when we saw it in action as well. Yep. Um, definitely understands the matchup, but we'll get to see him on September the 30th on this channel if you want to follow the progress of him at the APAC Championships. But I believe you've got a couple more casts here before that as well. I do indeed. I will be back in the Blizzard Studios for Europe Championship and America's Championship, not in that order, awkwardly in the other order that I said them, starting with America's moving on to Europe, and then uh, I'm not unfortunately casting uh, APAC championships. I would love to. I'd love to have followed the journey of Gundam Flame here, having done this event. But um, this is my first event spent casting any kind of, you know, Eastern scene Hearthstone. 
Um, you, Lorinda, have done a, a ton to cover China in particular and mm -hmm. some other events in, in Southeast Asia and Japan as well. And I've never had the opportunity to join you before. So I've personally enjoyed my first real up close and personal look at the, uh, the, the Eastern Hemisphere scene, if you like, and I've uh, been very, very impressed with some of the, uh, the, the play that we've seen, particularly from our winner, Mr. Gundam Flame himself. Yep, agree with everything you said. I've had a blast. I am going to end the stream now so you guys can at least hear the interview. Even if you don't speak Japanese, maybe you can pick up something more from it that you can pick up from us waffling about it. Yep. So for me, take care. And from Sotto, whatever Sotto wants to say. Yeah, no more than that. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Any any feedback, as always, you can get at me at Sotle, at C-O-L underscore Sotle on Twitter. That sort of plug might be a thing you want to do as well, Neil. That's okay, yeah. Get me at Lorinda Games <laughs> on Twitter. Thanks for the help. And we'll see you all soon, guys. Enjoy. Bye, guys. それではここで優勝選手インタビューをさせていただきます。インタビュアーは芥田さん、よろしくお願いいたします。先ほどこちらの方にあの、ま、実況席があるんですけれども、そこで見させていただいて、思わずマイクがついてるにもかかわらず、マイクいらないぐらいの大声を出させていただきました。最初のこのドルイドでファンドラスタグヘルも痛め
楽しさをこういった実況の場所で共有することができた自分で味わうことができたということは本当に素晴らしいことかなと思いましたあの本日お越しいただいた皆様参加していただいた皆様スタッフの皆様本当にありがとうございました、はい、よろしくお願いいたしますはい、えー、皆さん土日2日ともお疲れ様でしたあのオンライン予選もさることながら57人の中の今回トップ1人ガンダムフレーム選手ということで日本代表本当におめでとうございます<笑>はいやはりですね今回のガンダムフレーム選手の使っていたドラゴンウォリアーが僕にとっては非常に印象に残ってたりしたんですがあのキュレーターというミニオンで何回サンドローしてるんですかと<笑>言った話がございまして。はいまあ、そういった点もですねあの運の上振れでもあったりもしましたがやっぱりこの現状強いデッキというのをめちゃめちゃ使い方がうまいですねガンダムフレーム選手はですね、あのー、<笑>そういった意味でも、あのー、やっぱり1次元目から先生が出てきたりパンドラルが出てきたりそういったですね、まあ、マリゴスのなぎ払いが何回見えましたかこの土日でもう演出的にもパフォーマンス的にもプレー的にも本当に楽しめる2日間でした本当にありがとうございます。お願いいたしますはい、えー、解説を務めさせていただいたアルスです本当に本当に長い、えー、期間の間、えー、皆様お疲れ様でした、えー、そして多くの選手の方々の、まあ、ドラマを見させていただいたわけではあります正直満足です正直満足ですただガンダムフレーム選手は言ってくださいましたアジア太平洋夏季選手権そして世界選手権ブリズコンこれで優勝するというドラマを見せてくれるということを言ってくださいましたのでぜひそのドラマを見させていただきたいと思います世界選手権でも頑張ってくださいありがとうございました、はい、お願いいたしますいやーどうも新一郎ですありがとうございますいやあのー、今回その実況解説を務めているこの三人が僕非常に羨ましいと思いましてゲームを実際に見ながら自分の思い吐き出せるっていうこの三人が本当にいいなと思ったんですけど決勝の舞台だけ本当にお客さん、皆さんが羨ましいと思いましてっていうのも本当に決勝を見てて落ち着かないんですよ、一つ一つ言っていってがもう本当に僕もドキドキして今もすっごい手震えてるんですね、なんでもうこのハーストーンという一つのゲームに出会えてこんなに素晴らしいゲームが見れるのかともう本当に感動させていただきましてもう本当に皆さんも熱くなっていると思ってるんですよ、決勝戦いかがでした、皆さん。素晴らしかったですよねいや本当僕ねみんなと一緒に前でわーってやりたかったんですよ、もう実況席すぐ隣にいたんで、うろうろうろうろつかなくて、いや本当にすみません、なくなっちゃいましたね、いや本当にこの度はガンダムリオさん、おめでとうございました、さらなる躍進、僕、本当に期待しますんで、応援してます、頑張ってくださいガンダムフレーム選手、おめでとうございます。アジア太平洋夏季選手権のご案内をいたしますこちらは日本時間 11, 10月の1日と2日アメリカロサンゼルスで行いますこちらはブリザードチャンネルで実況いたしますぜひ皆さん一緒にガンダムフレーム選手を応援いたしましょうそれでは次回のハーースストーン日本選手権でお会いいたしましょうさようなら<音楽>それではここでプレスのフォトセッションを行いますフォトセッションの後に抽選会を行いますので皆さんはそのままのお席でお待ちください。